Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Museum of the City of New York. My name is Fran Rosenfeld, and I'm the Director of Public Programs at the Museum. Uh, and thank you for coming to tonight's program, New York Silver Conversation on the Craft, which is inspired by uh, the museum's new ongoing exhibition, New York Silver Then and Now. And this is an installation that links the rich history of metalsmithing in New York City to present day artistic practice. It features newly commissioned works by leading metal workers created in response to historical objects from the museum's own collection. If you haven't had a chance to see the exhibition yet, um, I hope you will come back soon and do so. We're open every day of the week, 10 to 6, and it's on the third floor. Uh, tonight, we are thrilled to welcome a panel of contemporary artists and metal workers featured in the exhibition to discuss their latest work and the state of silver as an art form today. Our distinguished panelists are Ted Muling, a jewelry and decorative object designer, Myra Mimlish Gray, an award-winning artist and professor at SUNY New Paltz, and Preston Jones, a silversmith in the Hollowware Makers Department at Tiffany & Company. The discussion will be moderated by Wendy Goodman, the design editor for New York Magazine. And before we begin, I just would like to thank our promotional partners on this evening's event who are listed in your programs. We appreciate their support. And I want to mention to you uh, an upcoming event that uh, we hope you will consider coming back for. On Wednesday, October 11th at 7 p.m., we have a program called Our 400-Year Battle with Water by historian and writer Russell Shorto, the best-selling author of The Island at the Center of the World. And he's gonna revisit New York's centuries-old battle with water from early Dutch efforts to tame the tides to our present day responses to climate change. And you can find out more on our website, mcny.org slash events. Uh, following tonight's program, we invite you to join us one flight upstairs in the museum's rotunda for a glass of Prosecco. Um, and finally, if you would take this moment to silence uh, your phones or anything that buzzes, but please feel free to tweet during the program using the hashtag MCNYLive. And now I would like to welcome the curator of New York Silver, Janine Felino, up to the stage because she is going to tell you a little bit more about the exhibition and introduce the speakers at greater length. So thank you very much. Thanks, Fran. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here this evening, and I want to invite all of you. Uh, you are uh, metalsmiths, your professors, your students, your curators, auctioneers, uh, all people who I know love silver. Maybe they love their grandmother's silver, I don't know, uh, but they're also interested in seeing what silversmiths can do today. Uh, and it's just really, really a personal pleasure to have you all uh, here tonight. So um, just to set the stage a little bit, I was invited to uh, create a show based upon the museum's renowned collection of American silver. And uh, at the time that I was invited uh, to do this, I thought that maybe it was an opportunity to expand the story a little bit and to share a bit about what people are doing today. I've been a curator my whole career, and I've had the pleasure of working with lots of contemporary artists. Uh, so grateful for those opportunities to look inside the, the mind and the studio of an artist and see what they're up to, what they're thinking of, what they're riffing off of. And I thought it would be great if we could bring that uh, to the public. So what I did was, uh, with the museum's uh, permission, I invited uh, about 25 artists in what I like to call the creative class. So they are metalsmiths, uh, by, I would say about half of them, but the other half are um, uh, from all kinds of, uh, drawn from all, all different uh, walks of, of the creative life, industrial designers, jewelers, 
uh, interior designers and such. So I was um, uh, delighted uh, to be able to bring them together and actually to get them to work a bit outside of their comfort zone uh, to produce something new by interacting with these historic pieces uh, and making something that is you know, fresh and vital and that relates to their practice uh, even as it has a, gives a respectful nod to some or something uh, in our country's history of, of metalsmithing. So uh, let's take a couple of quick looks here. Um, these are the, the 25 artists, and as you can see, the silversmiths take up the bulk of the group, uh, and that makes perfect sense. Uh, but we, we really were honored to have uh, so many people from, from all these different, uh, uh, different uh, divisions of the art world, shall we say. And many of those who were not trained silversmiths actually were brought into contact with a maker who could help bring their vision to life. And I've just put a couple of, um, sorry, I've put a couple of little um, notes here, like Michelle Okadoner had her work made by Gallmer. Chitra Ganesh, who did two works for this uh, show, had something done by both Wendy, Mike, uh, by Michael Geick and Wendy Yathers, both of whom are in the exhibition, and so forth. So uh, we really found a way to marry these concepts, uh, the, the designs, with a working metalsmith who could help them really see their pieces come to life. Not everything can happen just as a designer thinks. They need a metalsmith to help work that part out. And uh, right off the, the mark, uh, we were offered something that was totally unexpected for the exhibition. Uh, Sheila Bridges, who is an interior designer, saw this wonderful porringer by Peter Vergero, and it's a rather remarkable uh, and, and uh, detailed handle, as you can see here. And from that, she immediately saw a graphic idea that she was able to translate into wallpaper. And bingo, we had our, our wallpaper design for the exhibition, which matches uh, beautifully sort of a, as a uh, comparison with the more historic flocked uh, textile wallpaper that we have uh, in the gallery. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, showing you some of the artists who produced work for the exhibition, and then the artists themselves will come up and talk about their own work as well. So this is just, for those of you who didn't see the gallery upstairs or want a little bit more information, this is just a, just a short uh, a view of that. So um, in each case, the historic object is on the left and the contemporary piece is on the right. Uh, this uh, really elaborately chased and engraved, chased and represented a picture by Tiffany and Company inspired several artists to make new works, uh, including Robert Loeb, who is a sculptor that I got to know, who works primarily in aluminum, and this is aluminum, and we did sort of stretch the notion of silver to include a broader concept of metalsmithing. And uh, Robert uh, found that an interest in nature was part of his own practice, and so he decided to do something working with a rock he had found in the great outdoors. Uh, using a pneumatic hammer, he, he fashioned this big rock that he found. It's sort of like an evocation of what is found uh, in its natural site. And then uh, you can sort of make it out here. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's a branch that comes down here, and that was produced in fine silver uh, thanks to his discussions with Ted Muling, who is here tonight, and Ted said, Fine silver will not need polishing, and this is a very big piece, so <laughs> it, will, it will look this way for a, a long time to come. Uh, Wendy Yothers took a kind of uh, aesthetic approach, uh, looking at these tall domed lids on our historic pieces. She was thinking about those tall skyscrapers that make New York so memorable, and she began working on her Gotham Tate a Tate set, which is here uh, on the right. And her final work is, uh, is this very tall, narrow, uh, cubist uh, product, which, uh, is, you know, which re it puts one in mind of deco designs, but are, in fact, uh, very modern. And you can see uh, evidence of, for instance, the Chrysler building uh, at some of these, these domes. And, uh, and other objects include things like this, uh, a, a snuff box, a rather ordinary kind of snuff box that you would have found in the 19th century with a tortoise shell body and a silver framework. Uh, that was a source of inspiration for two artists, one being Michelle Okadoner, who was enjoying the natural quality of the tortoise shell, and she turned to her own personal collection of uh, 
objects found in nature and had them cast and made into little boxes. So this one is called erosion, and it seems to be based upon a piece of a very, very worn piece of wood. For something totally different, the same box inspired Laureen Leon Boim to produce this little box. It looks rather large, but it fits in the palm of your hand. And she was uh, taking as her inspiration the contents of the snuff box, which is ground tobacco. That's a kind of a, like a cigarette would be today, offering the same kind of uh, uh, satisfaction as a cigarette. But uh, she took it to a more modern place. Uh, this is her nug box, which is meant to hold marijuana buds. And uh, so a very, very contemporary subject matter. Uh, for her husband, Constantine Boim, uh, both of them being industrial designers, Constantine uh, saw in the Porringer a real potential to update it for modern life. And you know, some people were taking things, looking at them from a functional standpoint, others were looking at it in a more abstract way. And Constantine saw this Porringer and thought it had great potential as a modern pillinger. So uh, this little, little guy down here is maybe, oh, a third the size of this big porringer, but just big enough for your morning pills. And uh, I've encouraged them, you know, all these objects belong to the artists, and uh, I've encouraged all of them to consider if there, if there are possibilities for uh, putting things into production, nothing would make me happier. I think we'd, we'd all be beneficiaries of their great, great thinking uh, on these topics. Um, let's see, moving quickly, I'll just, I know I don't have a whole lot of time, um, but I wanted to share this one piece, uh, which is a little hard perhaps to understand for some people if they haven't been to the gallery or even if they had. Uh, Sheila, who produced our design for the wallpaper, was very impressed by the, um, uh, the stories that I told the, the, the group, we had a workshop when we first began. I gave them a little thumbnail sketch of the history of silver, and in that discussion, I brought up the matter of silver and the, the sad aspects, the unfortunate aspects of its extraction. Uh, in the colonial world, all silver came from South America, and the people who were involved in mining it were indigenous people or they were Africans brought over as part of slave labor, and many, many of them died. So uh, Sheila thought about this, and she produced this spoon, uh, which is based upon the, uh, the slave ships uh, that were discussed uh, by abolitionists, the, the inhuman aspects of their uh, sto stowage in these, uh, in these vessels. So the, the handle of the spoon shows the, that pattern uh, impressed on it. And then in the, in the bowl of the spoon is the abolitionist symbol uh, that's, that shows a, a black man who is kneeling and saying, am I not a man and a brother? Her piece, which is called Tarnished, is really a profound thing because we often talk about a silver spoon, uh, people who are born with a silver spoon in their mouth, for instance, or how a silver spoon is a real sign of upward mobility, a sign of gentility. And this is, I think, for Sheila, this was her way of giving that silver spoon to the, all those people who never had the opportunity to really enjoy uh, what it was they were doing, understand the, the fruits of what it was they were laboring for. So uh, how are we doing on time? OK, two minutes. So at that, I will have to forego all of this. Um, I'm just going to spin through this quickly. And I use, they're all upstairs. This was the humorous one. Let's see, wait a minute. So I, this is the, the humorous one. Brian Weissman uh, produced uh, this fabulous cast silver piece uh, based upon a very elaborately uh, chased object by Tiffany that uh, is upstairs. And uh, this, is, this, is, this takes me back to Christmas time and, and spraying wreaths uh, w covered with macaroni. It's, uh, it's a wonderful piece that looks backwards and forwards and with, with great humor and, and tenderness. But uh, now I want to tell you a little bit about our artists. Myra Mimlich Gray earned her Master of Fine Arts degree at Cranbrook Academy of Art in 1986, and her Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the Philadelphia College of Art in 1984. A professor at the State University of New York at New Paltz, 
Myra has received many awards for her work. She is the recipient of the 2016 American Craft Council Award. She's been in inducted into the ACC's College of Fellows, and she recently received the very prestigious United States Artist Fellowship Award. Ted Muling has been designing jewelry and decorative arts inspired by organic forms found in nature uh, since 1976. Avoiding the conventions of industrial design, he works on his own designs in an artisanal fashion, allowing serendipitous surprises to occur. Muling produces multiples as well as unique objects using a variety of materials, including precious and semi-precious stones, metals, pearls, plastic, horn, and wood. Preston Jones, the youngest in our group of metalsmiths, has traveled the world to enrich his arsenal of metalworking skills, from chasing and repoussé with monks in northern Chiang Mai to signing singing alms bowls, sorry, to making singing alms bowls on the streets of Bangkok and smithing in the silver studios of Tiffany and Company. Using his travels as his inspiration, Preston builds from an array of global influences to create metalwork, which brings the Silk Route to the, United, uh, to the New York City stoop. He is currently working for Tiffany and Company in their hollowware department. And Wendy Goodman, our moderator, has served as New York Magazine's design editor since October of 2007. She is responsible for New York's twice annual design issues and regular great room features. She also produces the annual Design Hunting magazine. Previously, Goodman was the style editor at Harper's Bazaar. Now, I had one other thing I had to tell everybody, and it was that um, if we would, hold your questions until the end of the sessions. Uh, we'll make sure there's time for that. Uh, there'll be plenty of Q&A, and when the program is over, the Prosecco will be served in the first floor rotunda. That's the most important thing. Uh, and last, last but not least, I'm pleased to say that we just had an article published in Antiques Magazine on the show, and I will, uh, when I come down, I'll just pass it around. It's just a PDF, but uh, hopefully we'll get a, more, a greater national audience for this very, very deserving exhibition. So I think Ted is up first. There. Thank you. Do I do I use this or like this is for? <laughs> uh, okay. okay. So um, hi. I don't know how to do this. Um, anyway. Janine's invitation to see the um, collection here was really interesting to me. I love looking at old things. That's what I thought. Um, and to see the collection here was really a privilege. Um, when I saw the collection, and it was edited, I was very attracted to the late 19th century fern picture, which um, Preston was also um, interested in and inspired by. Um, I collect ferns, and I love the exuberant, decorative, and textural repoussé. Very, very different from my own unusual work, um, and a real challenge for me to try and figure out how to make something like that. Um, anyway, um, I don't have any real formal training in silver or goldsmithing. Um, um, my degree is in industrial design from Pratt Institute. Um, back in the 70s, before design was glamorous and um, <laughs> happening. Um, and back then, the emphasis was on um, form following function. And I, I loved actually studying industrial design and learning about abstraction and form. Um, and this rational approach uh, suited me. Um, but after graduating, I really was unhappy working in an office and I wanted to work alone. Um, I had an idea to make a metal piece, and um, it was a small, small sculptural piece in silver, 
And my friend and ex-classmate, Tucker Wiemeister, taught me in a very basic way how to hammer, how to solder, and how to anneal. And I kind of took it from there and just bought my own equipment and started playing with it. Um, and I think as most artisans know, unlike um, architects, industrial designers, um, people who are in two dimensions and on the computer a lot, um, working directly with a material um, is a great advantage. Um, there are surprising and serendipitous things that happen. Um, and it, the material often tells you what it wants to do. And um, anyway, with a lot of experimentation and practice, um, I started making things. Um, my design heroes at that time were the sort of Scandinavian artisans of the 1950s. Uh, Henning and Kopelich, George Jensen, Tapio Verkula, um, Hans Wegner, um, and I thought there was, it was a sublime um, and s very rational approach to design. Um, my husband is Swedish, um, and there's a Swedish word called logum, which means just enough. And um, it's kind of my sensibility, not too much, not too little. Um, it's why you don't see Swedish millionaires driving Rolls Royces, they drive mm -hmm. Volvos. <laughs> so there's a certain restraint to their, um, and, and the same with their design, I think. Um, anyway. This piece, and also this uh, perfume flask, I, I kind of fell in love with because they're so tactile. I wanted to touch them. I wanted to hold them. And, um, and I also collect ferns, and I love early plant forms. Um, and it's really beautifully done. Um, so, um, um, and I think at that time, the, no expense, no, it, it took endless amounts of time, and it was just um, almost like a, a work of, of love to make such an extraordinary thing. Um, and I also imagine that it kind of reflected the Victorian passion for the exotic. Um, and earlier in the century, um, explorations and discoveries, you know, by Captain Cook, Alexander von Humboldt, um, and Darwin, um, I think informed the Victorians to uh, look at the world differently and see evolution and appreciate early, early forms of life, whether it be animal, plant, um, or whatever. So I think this um, extends from that. Um, let's see. And looking at the picture, I kind of imagine it in the late 19th century on a table with a linen tablecloth in a garden full of cold well water. <laughs> and <laughs> I can imagine just the, the beautiful condensation purling up on it and the coldness and, you know, silver is a great conductor. And um, it just, you sort of want to touch it. I mean, it's, it's a strange form, actually. It's kind of got a big belly. You might want to embrace it. Um, but I think, I think it looks very tactile, and I think you would want to touch the coldness in a hot summer day. You would want to pour out of it. It looks like a wonderful thing to pour out of. Um, anyway, so I kind of fell in love with this strange picture. Um, anyway, so this became an excuse, this whole project, for me to try my hand at repoussé, which is something I never imagined doing. And I took some classes with the Bulgarian maestro Valentin Yatkov. And I took three classes with him, and he's quite lovely, and, and um, I got the gist of it. Um, how to hammer into pitch, and back and forth, and yeah, it takes a lot of time, so I practiced. Um, I tried doing fern, not a pitcher, but I really wasn't up to the task, so I had to try other things. It, I was really just not um, skilled enough um, it's back. Sorry.
Do I go left or right? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, there. there. Sorry, sorry. I did. Do, that was the original. Anyway. This is, um, these are some books of mine, and uh, they sort of illustrate uh, sort of a paradoxical way I, I have of looking at things these days. On the upper left-hand side is um, an eel dish by Henning Koppel for George Jensen, and I think it's sublime. I think it's beautiful. I think it's amazing. And, um, and it's not necessarily practical. Um, I mean, if you touch that, you get fingerprints on it and it's not so pure anymore. Um, but it is a beautiful piece of sculpture. Um, the piece on the right is an 18th century piece by Meissonier, and it's a lot of pieces cast from nature and then assembled. Um, and it's a tureen, and with it, what's on it reflects what the soup would be, from leeks to dead ducks and whatever. <laughs> I mean, it's just insane, and I think it's really wonderful. To the left over there is, um, it looks like, um, well, there are Eskimos on it. It looks like uh, Alaska. And it's from the Sam Wagstaff collection. It's made by Gorham in the late 19th century. And around the time that Alaska was acquired from Russia um, by us, um, I think it's hilarious. Um, I think it has nothing to do with taste. But I can imagine whatever <laughs> robber baron had it on his table <coughs> kind of delighted his guests with mm -hmm. such a such a thing. It's, I think it's just childlike and funny. Anyway, and down here on the right is um, a jewel box of Princess Anne of Austria from 1873. And this isn't a very good picture, but it is the most virtuosic repose I've ever seen. Mm. Um, it's in gold, actually. And I, and I love the texture. And again, it's just, I just, I want to touch it. I want to like rub my fingers over it. Um, Anyway, so I have this thing where I love the rational and the, and the simple, but I also really love this extravagance. Um, now, Henning Koppel's, um, yeah, that's enough of that. Um, this summer, I was kind of compelled to uh, make some silver cups because I wanted to experience drinking out of silver. And so Mats and I would sit out on the terrace and drink white wine mm. for lunch out of silver mm. cups. And mm. it, w it was really lovely. And it Beautiful. just holds the cold. It's, just, it's, just, it's an extraordinary experience and the reflection inside. And um, Anyway, it's very nice, lovely experience. Such a poet. Oh, um, such a poet. And I think... Uh, this is a piece I did many years ago, and it's just a, a, a reflector. And I think in previous times, um, silver was appreciated for how gorgeous it looked in, re in candlelight, when candlelight was the light. Um, this is a hammered um, convex, concave surface, not polished. And I think it looks a bit like mother of pearl or something. You don't really know what it is. Um, and I think that's kind of mysterious and, and nice. Um, the first pieces I ma made are these things. And so the Tucker made, helped me make these things. It was basically hammering um, a flat, although complex f flat form. The trans, uh, uh, it, it, it goes from this flat to a sort of a, a thin but voluminous line. And I didn't know what it was, it was just a thing. It was the 70s, so people started wearing them in their hair. Um, so, you know, you go to the disco and wear your, wear your pick. Um, and also, I was looking at ginkgo leaves. I lived in Brooklyn, lots of ginkgo trees. It looks a bit like a whale tail. I don't know what, how I thought this thing up. Um, but anyway, it was an experience to make this thing. and. Um, and uh, with time and learning and practice, I figured out how to do a bit of hollow wear. So these are some spoons that I made with hollow handles and kind of, um, yeah, kind of in the vein of the Scandinavians or the ones down on the bottom, um, a bit like uh, water lilies, I thought. Um, this is also some fairly early work. Um, the pitcher um, in silver and later on in porcelain. Um, 
was the porcelain was done for Nymphenburg in Germany. Um, but anyway, it was many, many years after I did the silver one. And it's a very simple shape. It's an oval. It's nice to hold. It looks a bit like a bone. Um, it's kind of essential. The, it's very nice to pour from. Um, the other pieces of silver are kind of um, abstractions of seashells, not literal, but uh, trying to get the essence of the graceful curves of a seashell. Um, And this is another a volute bowl that I made at Nymphenburg um, in porcelain. And these are some brooches that I did um, that are sort they're, they're like quite like shells actually. But the the pin is sort of an inter the spiral of the shell. Um, the pin is an integral um, part of the um, close closure. So you kind of spin the pin around into the spiral of the shell in order to uh, close it. Um, the rice earring on the left is about as logum as it gets. It's a very, very simple little earring, but it, I like it very much. If I wore earrings, I think I'd wear that earring, and it's like from 1970. Um, and even a small form can have presence, and actually it's sort of a punctuation, a very simple, but nice, um, yeah, a nice uh, detail, perhaps. And the other piece is a, is a shell earring, similar to the brooch, but simpler. Um, um, a bowl that I did with Stuben, very, very thick lead crystal, um, which was really globby, um, but beautiful glass. But they could cut amazingly in their cold room, and so we cut these um, concave facets, and I thought it looked a bit like a turtle shell. Um, the glasses on the right are with Loebmeyer in Vienna, who are known for their extremely thin glasses. And so they're kind of like bubbles with little flared lips, and I think they're nice to drink out of. Um, the plate on the top there is from a Spanish galleon shipwreck. It was silver, turned nicely black, and I think beautifully eroded. And um, Anyway, I, like, I collect things, strange things like this. Um, down here is a tea strainer in silver on top of a Nymphenburg cup. And the idea there was I, was I was trying to remove as much material as possible from a piece of silver um, with my drill bits. Drilling and drilling and drilling. Um, kind of like a leaf skeleton. And to see how much I could take away without and still maintain the structure. Um, and it came out kind of nicely, and it's very light. Uh, there's a spoon on the left, which is cast from nature. Um, just, you know, the, it's the art of the caster. You give him a, a twig, and he can bur they can burn it out and pour the silver in, and then we add the bowl of the spoon. So I do a lot of those. They're all unique, and I think they're kind of surreal and kind of beautiful. Um, the chrysanthemum candlestick is... Um, shamelessly decorative, and, um, and I don't know what to say about it, but I was compelled to do it. Um, this drawing by Durer um, kind of changed the way I see, and um, I love his nature studies because they're not product, they're not a commission. I think they were really for himself, and I will never see our weed-filled garden as ugly again after seeing this, because it's just so touchingly beautiful. So he's taking something very ordinary with an extraordinary drawing, and kind of, it's a bit of a revelation, I think. And uh, I like the, the simplicity of that. You know, it's not some Dutch still life with fabulous flowers and insects and over the top. Um, anyway, it's an influence. So Mance and I have a house in Long Island. Often we walk on the beach. Um, and I'm always collecting things from shells to seaweed. And on the top there is some seaweed, and I love the graceful, twisted lines of the seaweed. And there are these um, bladders that hold water, so they float. They kind of look like eggs or olives or something. And so I kind of riffed on it and made these articulated gold necklaces, um, which move rather nicely and um, in a way replicate 
so I'm getting into replication here, which is far from what I was originally doing. Um, and I oxidized it black, which is a little perverse to do to gold, but it makes it look more like the seaweed. And on the bottom are some spoons of seaweed also, um, salt spoons, you know, seaweed, salt water. Um, this is another uh, shipwreck piece, a lovely, um, simple form, um, elegant, functional, and obviously was in the sea, and through accretion, sea creatures turned it rococo. And it, yeah, it was um, not its fault. It just, just became that amazing, crunchy thing. Um, oh dear. Um, so that's our car on the left in Sag Harbor. We've never washed it. It's an old Volvo. <laughs> so I'm studying lichen. And um, on the right, it's a, a, I was practicing for this box down here, which is in the museum. And I made Matt's a box. And it's sitting on our table in the terrace. And we also have cedar chairs. And they're all upholstered in lichen. And anyway, I love the lichen. And you know reindeer eat, um, eat lichen. So. Um, uh, the piece on the bottom actually is a Japanese um, box that celebrates um, ship wood that's been eaten by this mollusk, the shipworm. And, um, and I love how they celebrate the deterioration and the erosion. And um, anyway, in the box above, I did for a, a book um, uh, with text by Oliver Sacks, which involved early plant forms. It took him to Micronesia. Talked a lot about um, Captain Cook, and um, I used this Polonia wood, which looked like the seashore to me. It looked like wave patterns. And I got out my drill bits and did a job on it, thinking of these, these amazing ships that deteriorated like that. Now, this, this is another walk on the beach, kind of extraordinary on the left, pretty ordinary on the right. But when you're walking, you notice these things, and um, you sort of want to capture them. And, a digital picture is not really very satisfying. Maybe a silver print would be nice. Um, um, but I thought that I could handle representing that. And it was a very ordinary thing that I see often. And so this is um, my frying pan with a sheet of silver in it in various stages of hammering to get the seashell and the texture of the sand. and. Um, um, it was very fun. I mean, it took, took a long time. I don't know how long it took. And these are the finished boxes. Um, and I set some pebbles into it, like um, stones, from the beach. I polished the bottoms so that they would kind of disappear, and um, like air or water. And um, yeah, I might put my father's ashes in one because he loved the beach. And you can put like treasures in it, like seashells or jewels. And that's it. That's the story. Hmm? What? Go there. Oh. Myra. Can you guys hear me okay? Cool. Hi, um, I'm really happy to be here and I'm thrilled to be a part of this show. It's very exciting to be working with so many talented people. And I know that this idea has been in Janine's head for a very, very long time because she was talking about it when we first met in the early 90s. <laughs> and uh, it was Janine's great generosity that uh, allowed me to inspect objects at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, firsthand, in hand, and it was uh, quite remarkable to have that opportunity. So thank you, Janine. Um, you know, start, I almost feel like I could remember, like yesterday, my teachers telling me, you have to be a metalsmith. Um, you need to keep doing this. There's some sort of sense of urgency that the, um, the practice needed some advocacy 
And that's another reason why I think this show is really important and that I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, so I kind of started, oh, sorry, hang on. <laughs> How's that? I, um, I saw myself basically as a postmodern journeyman. I was making this work uh, after graduating from um, school in the late 80s and then moving forward. I thought that uh, it was important to critique the field. And then through that process, I came to understand it and to deeply admire it and to pay homage to it through the work that I could make. Um, so in this case, I set out to make a traditional object and then I would bisect it and represent it as a portrait of itself. So what you were given was the absent object. And in that way, I believe that I could create resonance around the thing itself. I was also interested in interpreting the utility of such objects. And in this case, there, um, there are these brackets adhered to the side of the thing. And the entire piece is hollow constructed out of metal the thickness of a dime. So um, you see this like fine silver line that belies the apparent solidity of the form. And it reveals that it's a construction. So for me, it's important to sort of celebrate those aspects of making, the residue of making, and at the same time to um, play off of uh, the silversmith or the artist's opportunity to create fictions. And so in terms of thinking about objects as portraits, um, the work evolved into these portraits of silver in flux. I think we could think of it maybe as um, melancholic in a way, because clearly something bad has happened. <laughs> or um, perhaps it's something good, as in maybe this piece is evolving into the next silver piece. And in fact, it tells the story of silver's constant uh, redefinition uh, as various civilizations and histories uh, come into play and determine what those forms are going to be. It's also very much aware of um, like the role of presentation and the role of service uh, that is implicit and explicit in objects of uh, this field. Um, so this, this particular piece seems to present a certain anxiety of the hostess, perhaps. <laughs> uh, scale is an important thing to play with. Uh, I guess I should say that that the candelabrum is part of a two-part two candelabrum, um, and it also is made out of thin gauge metal. So it's, it's, I'm really interested in mastery, but I'm also suspicious of it as well. And I understand that uh, simply trump loying every idea is not in and of itself a virtue. Um, so uh, it's important to think about how I can apply the skills that I've worked very hard to attain toward a critical contemporary dialogue. So that, in a nutshell, is kind of what I do. I want to keep these processes alive. I want to exemplify how they can be um, correspondent with ideas bigger than themselves in a, in a sort of self-contained uh, way. This chafing dish, as you can see, in, by stepping up the scale, the drama and the kind of absurdity of it comes to another um, place. It's just like a big pig hogging the entire table. <laughs> and it's made out of uh, thin gauge copper and a found object element. I don't usually use found objects, but sometimes it's important because it helps to expedite the idea. Uh, in this case, I took a silver plated copper chafing dish part from a you know, thrift store and then copper plated it so it would match the copper. And um, what's interesting for me here is, aside from just the drama of it and the, um, the theatricality of it, the, uh, the way that I was able to allow myself to let the seams hang out and to just kind of loosen up. So in the construction, like if I wanted it to get bigger or turn to the left, I could just add a piece and overlap it and let that flap sit there on the surface. So it kind of goes back and forth between the illusion and the fiction uh, of this flow of metal. Um, and then it's also inflating and deflating and imitating upholstery in certain areas. Um, and then the, the chasing, which Ted did such a nice job uh, showing us in his presentation, uh, which is that process of repousseing and like lifting and um, the plane of the material um, and then going pushing it back in to get detail. 
Here, these big swirling things are actually creating a lot of structure to the form, because otherwise it would just collapse under its own weight. So it was f very fun to kind of treat it almost like a drawing. And the hammer and the stakes become like my drawing instruments. And then actual metal smithing itself is almost like yoga smithing, because I'm sitting on the floor like slamming it with the hammer on, like <laughs> two things going on at the same time. <laughs> And just for the little technical moment here, the pieces, it's soldered, it's silver soldered, it's low temperature soldered, it's brazed, it's riveted, it's whatever it takes to get the damn thing to sit on the table. <laughs> so, you know, thinking about objects kind of expansively, and now uh, this is kind of, a, uh, kind of an ongoing way that I investigate the field, the process, the material, and its place in history. And in this case, it's um, um, a magnification strategy, which I think you can see in the piece that I have in the show here, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I became really interested in the hammer mark as a form of propaganda. Uh, and we understand it when we see the arts and crafts movement. And, um, you know, that was beckoning back to an earlier time, and at the same time, really celebrating that surface, making it very apparent. This is a handmade thing. Um, this is, you know, the spirit of the worker and all these other things that come with that. The ethics and the value of something well done, you know. Uh, all, however you want to apply uh, the meaning of that hand remark to your own understanding of it, but I understood it as an opportunity to make craft propaganda. So um, this piece is about four feet across. It's all hollow. Um, each bowl was made and then braised together. It's brass and it's brassy, as in it's really obnoxious. And when you look at it, it, it like looks back at you with a million eyeballs. Um, the, the construction, ooh, I'm gonna try the pointer. Ah, see this line here? <laughs> so this is like early Photoshop, man. I was scanning metal into, you know, on the Xerox machine. And then I was kind of whacking it into Photoshop and flipping it around. And um, to me, that was really <laughs> a step forward. Um, but it was important, again, to reveal that it's like bilaterally symmetrical. So it's a, it's a fake hammered surface. So it's there and they're looking at it, you're getting hypnotized by it, you're diving into it. But then aspects of its construction reveal the, um, the facade of it. On the other hand, I was exploring the idea in silver, in a scale uh, that could be part of your daily ritual, you know, a cup, a beaker type of inspired cup uh, with the possibility of, you know, um, a cartouche or engraving or whatever happening there. But in this case, it's blown out and magnified hair marks, right? And this, you know, this work is basically like a battle with this crap over here on the right, which is like the stuff you buy at Pottery Barn and Crate and Barrel and, yeah, you know, your toilet paper holder, your <laughs> magazine rack or whatever. So my work is just a, you know, refutation of the, uh, the commercially produced hammer mark in a way. So in thinking about how I prepared for the project here, you know, I went in there with my, uh, my iPhone <laughs> and was zooming in on the objects that we were looking at. So partly I was uh, smitten by the aesthetic characteristics of the engraving. Um, but then, you know, also one could, one, many of the artists have been inspired by what those engravings meant, said, implied. Um, and so on the, on the left is the, uh, the Kirstead, Cornelius Kirstead uh, tankard. It's a hunk of that. Over here is uh, the, the little beaker, which I just love the idea of thinking of somebody being like, damn, Catholics grinding away with the, <laughs> the sharp thing. I'm a fan of iconoclasm. And like, you know, that just felt to me like something inspiring. You see the clay, <laughs> clay as like a squishy way to get a groove going, um, a knife, cutting into paper, so incising the mark. So again, one, one mark is like maybe a little more emotional. The other mark is more analytical, how I understand the, the kind of um, my process in interpreting these, these marks. It's made out of strips that are like six inches wide. And you know, I could have special ordered a 16 inch diameter disc or something, but I don't think I would have had the freedom uh, to 
allow things to happen, to get deeper, to, to react to what was happening. Like that chafing dish, hey, I want it to have another groove here, and to kind of work with it that way in a more direct fashion. Um, and then, you know, it was this piece here reminds me of like King Kong chained down, you know. <laughs> Every time you bring a torch to a piece of metal like this, it's going like this, and you're saying, can you please just sit down? I'm trying to solder you. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's just a battle, it's a full-on battle. <laughs> but I think you can see um, how the surface, you know, starts to then sit down and relax into itself after many hittings. Um, and this is the finished piece. And you know, for me, the one thing I was looking at the engraving. There's like a very kind of awkwardness to it. You step back from it, these beautiful laurel leaves, whatever. And then when you get and zoom in on it, there's like this sense of chaos and struggle happening in that wrought surface. Um, also these chips, I was really in love with the chips. I had made a whole bunch of chips and they were laying all over the place. At one point the piece was called Chips and Dip, but I just... <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, you know, the idea that these chips could kind of grow into a handle form. Maybe not a, believe, not, not a perfectly functioning handle, but it's, I think, like a lot of my work, it reflects the idea of an object becoming kind of becoming something else. And um, then, you know, I chose to leave it in its slab configuration so that it would sort of just almost read like a core sample of the surface of an object. And that's my piece. Mm. <laughs> I still have 30 seconds, so I got one more thing to say. That is that like a lot of times people come to my work and, uh, and they, they say, what is it for? <laughs> and my answer to that is it's to provoke that question. So. happen. Um, this museum has a reputation for representing uh, New York City's culture, and the show really fortifies its standing as a patron and promoter of the arts. Um, in my opinion, I think this show shines a light on the fact that not all silver is historical, and some of it, maybe even some of the best, is being made right now. Um, so I said, so as I said, um, I've been working, well, my name is Preston Jones, I've been working um, for <laughs> Tiffany and Company for the last uh, about seven years, working as a silversmith, making mainly um, sterling silver trophies and um, um, basically one of a kind statement pieces. Uh, in my free time, I try to pursue an interest in metal smithing, um, nerding out in all sorts of places from uh, chasing and repoussé with silversmithing monks or making sing monk bowls, as Janine was saying, or most le recently um, learning some coppersmithing in Mexico. Um, basically, I seek these, uh, these experiences out. It's, a, it's an excuse to meet the locals, get my hands dirty, and really get involved with the culture. And then I tend to use these experiences Uh, I tend to use these experiences and uh, stories and skills as an inspiration for my work. Um, so, this is some of my earlier work on the left, on your left, is a Kiddush cup. Um, basically, five generations. At the bottom, it says, I uh, actually made it for my younger brother. And it says, his, like, Benjamin of Bruce, Bruce sitting in the crowd over there, um, of his father, Sid, also sitting in the crowd, and then his, and then Sid's father of, I'm not sure what his father's name, and then two blank, and then two blank um, plaques on the back for my younger brother's 
No, well, children, hopefully. And, um, and then another amphora type piece. It's actually kind of telling a story of when I was learning um, the chasing with the silversmithing monks. Basically, I had to bring um, a monk bowl to one of the monks and present it to him. And he said a prayer and everything. And then he accepted me as his student. Um, but let's talk about it. Uh, OK, so. As I mentioned earlier, the, the bunch of exhibited artists got, artists got together. And um, basically, we got to handle the museum's collection, talk about it, learn about it, its context and history. Um, and basically, the Tiffany Dogwood vase you guys seen earlier uh, was probably the most influential piece for me. Um, the designs and the chasing, the castings were blended so well, you can't even tell what was chased and what was cast. The, um, the foreground, the, black, the background, and the middle ground were just relentlessly realistic. Um, then the applied gold buds, if you can see. Uh, and then the handle and the lip kind of create a little, bit of a, a little bit of a break, kind of a, a pause in this chaotic design. Um, basically, the shape is kind of taken from um, a leather wineskin or a Greek Ascos shape. Um, and so for my piece, I'm going to actually continue playing with that idea. Um, basically, this unachievable, seemingly unachievable craftsmanship made me extremely jealous. Um, <laughs> and it beckoned a challenge. Uh, so, another object, other objects that were inspired by the collection was a bone marrow spoon mm -hmm. at the top, which really got me thinking about the utilitarian purposes for many of the silver objects. Um, during the colonial area, these were produced out of necessity, but you know, eventually these evolved into a type of showmanship, uh, where competition between major silversmithing companies. Uh, created like, kind of like a space race for the uh, most gaudy decorative statement <laughs> items um, of the guild, basically generally made in the Gilded Age. Um, OK, the, uh, the flask on the side over here by Don and, Don and Huss and Huff um, was also really inspirational to me. Basically, you know, the design was just extremely clean and just really sharp. While we were all handling it, uh, you know, all the, well, a lot of the experts couldn't agree on how it was made, whether it was chased, electroform, stamped and chased. We were looking at it for seams. Uh, we were all just kind of perplexed by it. And this kind of made me think that when, you know, 50, 70 years from now, I want silversmiths to be looking at this thinking, Wait, this was chased. No, this part was chased. Just kind of unsure of how it was made. But I'm going to give you guys a, a peek. Um, and if you see this kind of like flat blob thing kind of overlaid on top of the, the vegetation, maybe like a, like a fog going through the vegetation, just keep that in mind a little bit. I'll keep playing with that in my design. Um, so whether the object is a flask or a bone marrow, skin, bone, bone marrow spoon um, or a punch bowl, basically the, the, ob the utilitarian purpose is kind of like a, a blank canvas for, for us to put whatever we want onto. Um, but, when done, but when done right, the blank canvas can also drive the, the design. Um, based on some of these objects, I knew I wanted to create a piece for a, for a niche purpose that uh, has been overlooked by the pompous uh, cultures of the Victorian era and has never been de uh, de um, glorified by the decorative arts. So I chose to make my piece, my picture, for serving polke. Most of you have probably never heard of polke. It's, um, it's an old Aztec 
spirit distilled from basically the festering wound of an agave plant. So if you can see at the bottom left, um, basically they pull the leaves out of the top and the sap just kind of sits there and festers. And then after, I think it, eventually twice a day you can start, he has a big gourd and he's sucking it, he's siphoning it out of the agave and then it's later fermented. Um, so it's actually having a resurgence so it is an old Aztec drink, but it's having a resurgence in Mexico right now. So a lot of pulquerias are opening up all across Mexico, really driven by the Mexican hipsters. Um, <laughs> and they've been adding all sorts of flavors to it, pistachio and passion fruit. Um, you know, and it, so it made me think of uh, you know, the hipsters in New York. They're always trying to be ahead of the curve, trying to you know, find something niche that no one else has. Um, it's kind of like the craft beer craze in America right now, uh, to a less degree. But um, and it's so it's traditionally drank out of you know either a ceramic bowl or pitcher or a, a gourd. Uh, it's it's so niche, so exclusive. Money can't even buy it unless you're in Mexico because it has to be fresh. Uh, and unlike champagne buckets or wine carafes. It's never enjoyed refined luxury, as far as I know. Um, so I made a sample of some agave images uh, to kind of get a feel for the time I was about to sink into this project and to see if foreshortening some of these cactus spikes coming straight out, uh, seeing if that could kind of read, translate into the embossed metal. Uh, but my agaves were kind of a little cartoonish looking. Uh, so I used my desire for realism to get a first-hand experience. So I had to go to Mexico. <laughs> so my girlfriend and assistant draft person, Julie Ramos, and back there near Bruce and Sid, uh, we went to Oaxaca and got a little, uh, little agave crazy, drank a lot of pulque and visited a lot of mezcal farms. <laughs> And we learned a lot about the very strong uh, culture which has evolved around the agave. So with pictures and drawing samples in hand, it's ready to represent New York and Mexico. Um, so like I said, got a little agave crazy. Um, at the bottom left it was my first sketch, basically just trying to put any agaves on a form and seeing what it was like. Uh, then spent days, probably more like weeks, uh, creating my uh, agave inventory, I call it, of different species of agaves. Um, yeah, there's 28 species of agaves that actually make mezcal, and only a few of them make pulque. But um, so learned a lot about agave. So up, up the middle is my second attempt. Basically, I kind of took the, the form from the Tiffany Dogwood picture and tried to a little more strategically place those agaves on there. Still, I was kind of just ripping off the Tiffany Dogwood vase, so it wasn't quite my own. So then changed the form a little bit, made it a little more organic, made it a little closer to down to the right, made it a little closer to an actual um, wine skin and tried to make it a little more fleshy. You can see um, here. Ah, I tried to incorporate that kind of blob um, thing that I was talking about, the kind of overlay from the flask. I was trying to incorporate that to insinuate kind of the smokiness of, of the mezcal, kind of weaving through all the different agave species. And so this is kind of where you stretch the canvas, basically. Um, start out with a sheet of 12 by 24 inch uh, silver. And then rather than raising the piece, there was different, there was things in the way of raising, like time, money, and sourcing a large enough uh, piece of silver. So I ended up uh, creating this, this template, kind of looks like uh, Batman. But um, 
basically cut this out, cut this out, and started bending it around. Um, so you can see, this is my apartment. It's got my hammers and anvils and everything. And um, basically started bending out that, bending around that template. And, um, and then those tabs at the bottom were kind of folded in. Uh, this, this technique was uh, actually kind of taken from making the monk bowls. Basically, they make the monk bowls, they construct them. And um, so there's, it's very geometric. And then they actually planish out, hammer out all the seams to make it round. Um, that's a go, paper one. Basically, I made a paper like almost what I wanted and cut it apart, and that's how I got my template. Um, basically, that's when the tabs appears, when all the tabs were kind of closed, kind of geometric, and I was ready to um, planish the thing over a forming stake. Uh, Um, so I try to kind of personify my form a little bit, just pushing out the chest, making it stand proud, uh, really rounding out its, its booty, and um, trying to make like a nice pudgy roll under where the handle would be. Uh, so you can see a little bit of the process for right before I started chasing it, kind of sharpening drawing the design on the piece with the Sharpie, and then chasing. This is basically the first round of chasing. There was several rounds, because I had to anneal the piece and everything. Um, and I wanted it really deep. Um, so the entire time I was, I was working on my piece, one thing kind of stayed with me from when we were at the museum, handling all the work. Um, one of the master silversmiths who, who I hold in the highest regard proclaimed to the crowd of designers and silversmiths, said, the gloves are off. She, she threw the gauntlet on the ground, and we were all instantly challenged. You know, that statement kind of ignited a fire in me. I sat with many of the silversmiths I learned from, looked up to, and ones I've always wanted to meet. And these were the, a lot of the heavy hitters of New York silversmithing. And I had, I had something to prove, so I really uh, went at it with this, with this piece. Uh, OK, this is, I know this is me in there. Um, but basically, this is another piece that we held in the collection, I believe. Uh, it was called, it was a brandy, a brandy bowl. Uh, I wasn't really a big fan of it. It's kind of. <laughs> Kind of crude, not my style, but I did like uh, the bottom of it. Um, a nice detail for when you do drink it, you know, somebody kind of flash somebody with a design. So uh, this is actually the bottom of my piece. I tried to take the slide out because I didn't have a finished picture, but um, I took a bird's eye view of an agave, chased it, and then there's actually a row of gold leaves. Um, applied to it, and then there's a, that, that part becomes like a cartouche for putting, um, you know, some lucky owner's initials, or you can set a stone on it. Um, so it was, so I did this in my apartment, it was pretty, pretty hard, didn't have well, everything I needed, but, uh, so I had to make a tube for my hinge, so basically I took a, a battery, and I stuffed sand all around it and made a sta sand casting of it. So to do this, I took the battery, packed sand around it, pulled the metal frame, it was in two halves, pulled it apart, removed the battery, and in its place put a thinner pencil. Um, then put the, put the sand, the two sand halves back together, and the pencil's still in there. And then when I poured the metal uh, into the mold, it filled the cavity of the battery, but because the pencil was in the center of the battery, basically I had a, had a tube. So it was pretty rough. Um, so you can see the battery 
right there. I had to cut it in three. I have this rod to make sure it's pretty level. And this building it up, and then this is kind of the finished product. What about the, um, the neighbors? Uh, while I did have some idea of what the design was, um, I didn't have the whole thing in. I, I did know where a few of the major agaves and blooms were supposed to be. Um, but the kind of, but the rest of the design kind of, uh, kind of like manifested itself. Uh, I felt like Michelangelo chiseling out the, the slaves out of the big blocks of marble. Um, you know, it was as if I was excavating the agaves from the silver pieces. They kind of, they kind of just showed up when I, I saw them in the piece. They didn't show up. <laughs> um, so, for the lid, a lot of different ideas going around. Um, the center one, uh, this bloom was an actual picture from a from a bloom from an agave uh, that I had. I got it 3D printed, and I was going to cast it in gold, um, but. Uh, monetary limitations <laughs> dictate a lot of uh, design and process. Um, so right there on the left is the bloom that was 3D printed. And then this is the bloom that uh, I found. Somebody put it on a tomb, and um, which is really quite symbolic. Is, uh, an agave is uh, what they call monocarpic which means it blooms once and then it dies. Uh, so it usually takes anywhere between 30 and 60 years. Um, so basically I took that agave here and put this on my lid. Um, you can see that this is the kind of, this is basically the one that was settled on. Um, kind of hard to see the detail, but there's really fine uh, engraving work that mimic the, the actual little buds on there. Um, there's also, it's kind of hard to see too, but there's teeth on some of the agaves, really fine beading work. Um, another picture from a trip in Mexico, basically the, the curves, you know, of some of the agaves create a lot of depth. You can see this is probably about an inch deep of chasing on the thing. Um, I wanted a lot of the agaves to uh, interact, kind of pulling, tugging and pulling at each other. You can see this guy's wrapped around here. He also comes around, grabbing there, pulling around there. Um, and another shot um, of the, the Sharpie versus the finished product uh, with snake belly as a design. And finally, uh, the finished piece, uh, Odre de Magui is his name, uh, which translates to uh, skin full of an agave, skin full of agave. Uh, it holds two and a quarter liters, which is three bottles of champagne, <laughs> and uh, made of sterling silver and 16 karat gold. Had to, had to dilute stuff and things like that. Uh, stands at 11 inches with gold lip rings, <laughs> two of them, I can't see the other right here, uh, and a nice radiant smile. He's uh, 20, he's uh, gold vermeil on the inside. Um, this piece was the, basically the perfect storm for me of uh, experience and inspiration. It was kind of a culmination of my pent up desire to design and create. I wanted to make the most, the most intense piece I've ever handled. Uh, and like I said before, my goal was to perplex the trained eye of a, of a silversmith and leave them with the task of trying to figure out what was applied, what was chased, and you know, I, I gave it my best shot. Okay. Wait, 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 one more. Okay, okay. That's fine. All right, thank you.
Oh yeah. <clears throat> That was so fascinating and fantastic. Thank you all so much. So um, I am confused because what I didn't realize was all the different, like if you get gold, gold comes in an ingot, right? I mean, you start to work with gold in the gold bar. but. What I didn't realize was you can have a very thin sheet of silver or you have a, gold, a, a, a bar of silver. So can you talk a little bit about the, the actual starting the work of, of kind of wrestling with or, or making the silver? Because you showed a very thin sheet of silver and then your piece has so many, such depth to it. Mm -hmm. So. Is the depth coming from that one piece of very thin silver? Yeah, for the, for the most part, it is, the, whole, the entire piece is that one sheet of silver. So you saw the right. sheet was formed around into, into a volume yep. shape. Mm -hmm. And then basically working from the inside, I pushed certain parts out right. as high as I could. Right. Without, you know, every, as you push it out, it thins the metal because you're stretching it. So I got to push it out as far as I, as far as I could without breaking um, it or, or ripping it. it. Yeah. And then basically working back into it. And then right. also, you know, then you know, the material gets harder as you work it. So you have to anneal it. So then basically it's kind of like, dip, like you were saying, uh, it's a lot of back and forth, working yeah. from the front, working from the back yep. um, to make that volume. And then um, there was a, a little bit of applied pieces on the piece. Um, not really too much. But, like, for example, you have access to um, the material in a variety of forms, right. right? Right. You can buy grain, you can buy chunk, you can order jump rings if you wanted to make chain and wanted to have right. the and you can things melt already assembled. Right? Right. right. So it is like, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes I feel guilty as a silversmith because, you know, everybody's like, oh, silversmithing. And, you know, but the fact is there's a lot of uh, recycling. I mean, the material right. is constantly being regenerated and uh, the, the artist has the ability to, to reform it and translate it toward uh, a new stock product for, for using. And you start to work with it when it's cold. It, it, it needs to be worked cold. Is that right, yeah. Ted? Which is, which is different from, you know, forging steel or iron. Right. Which it becomes soft and malleable when it's red hot. It has to be worked quite fast. Right, right. But, um, you know, and the, the other thing, I mean, you can take an ingot of silver and put it through a rolling mill, and it and makes it thinner and thinner and thinner as you compress the rolls, and you can get different sizes of sheet right. out of that. Right. You can do the same with make wire, pulling it through a draw plate. Um, um, but the thing is that as you hammer the silver, the molecules um, become tighter and tighter, and it tends to split. You've really got to um, it. anneal it, heat it up to this certain temperature, mm -hmm. and and then it's soft again. Mm. And it's like it's kind of buttery. It's kind of lovely. Um, but then, if you keep hammering it, you can go beyond the point of. Um, it of, can, of malleability. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting thing also in the history of silver is silver was such a status symbol. People's tables were laden with silver, and silver was a very sort of emotional thing passed down, as you showed that beautiful piece, you know, generations. Now silver has a very different sort of role in life. Uh, how, do, how do each of you understand silver as it is an object appreciated by the public today. What do you think? What? Um, I don't think um, people appreciate uh, silver hollowware so much. Most people don't own it because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. You don't have, people mm -hmm. aren't going out and buying silverware, like silver tableware right. because right. you gotta, you gotta maintain it, you gotta polish it. You have to take care of it. You gotta take yeah. care of it. And, yeah. you know, 
doing the dishes is enough, but having to just right. polish it, uh, take it right. out just to polish it, right. and it hasn't even been used is, is another thing. But what would you tell those people? What is the value of having something that has well, also been worked? You use it, if you use it every day, you don't have to. Right. Uh, do it. That's so right. It won't, it's not going to tarnish if you use it again. Right. If you have a silver ring, it's going to be fine. But if you right. leave it on your shelf for a while, it's not going to look great. Right. Um, I but think it's a, it's, a great, it's a great object. You just got to love it. Yeah, but it. it does age. It scratches. It you know, mm -hmm. uh, it, um, there's a, you know, fine old silver. Um, there's, it's called a butler finish, where it's used for generations, and it's just polished and polished. But it has a, a kind Little. of a wear to it that's very beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful! Um, I love that. And I use silver, like I have silver from the flea market, some old um, Danish silver that I use every day, and I don't care that it's a bit tarnished or a bit funky. Mm -hmm. um, I also, when I work with Nymphenberg, I'm making the finest porcelain or imaginable. And it's not so nice to use stainless steel on hmm. a beautiful piece of porcelain. Right. There's a softness to the, and a warmth to the silver. Silver also has antibacterial qualities. You know, it conducts the heat of your hand. It's, ni it's just nicer yeah. all around. So y you have to experience it in a way. In the same yes. way that I made the cup to experience the cold liquid, yeah. um, yeah, but it's impractical, and it's hard. I know that I, I work for a company in Vienna, and they can't. They have all these beautiful designs from Joseph Hoffman, the Vienna Secession period. Nobody will buy it. You can't get the oligarchs to buy silver now because mm. everyone has a perfection complex. They have a what complex? Com a perfection. Oh, perfection. Everything complex. has to be absolutely perfect, and that's I think right. unfortunate because. It's more beautiful as you use it, I think. I think so. Yeah, but I mean, I think many of the objects that we call to mind, um, for example, in the show, are presentation pieces, and they're uh, they have a uh, like a uh, a different kind of role too. Like I love the description and the imagine, you know, having that experience of putting that beautiful spoon in the mouth and having that. But I think. The other thing about silver is the way that it's been used, uh, you know, to bribe and to twist arms mm -hmm. and to persuade, mm -hmm. and as a surrogate for people, as you know, ownership and all these other things. So there's this like kind of transactional nature of silver. But it, but it was money. It was it's wealth. It's totally yes. straight up money. And and, uh, and and a lot of the great silver mm -hmm. from the 16th, 17th, 18th century was melted down totally. for coin when they had wars. Mm -hmm. So some of the great Messonnier pieces, right. with all that work, are Actually, over. Uh, for my castings, I probably mel melted yeah. down about five or six silver coins. You did. Just kind of a funny play because a lot of the hand hand a lot of the objects we handled were old colonial pieces that were mostly wow. made of uh, coin silver. Right. Yeah. That's why when people like bring their object to you and say, can you make me a new blah, blah, blah. And you know, you try to encourage them to think that the silver that they're getting back is actually might be some many generations ago, silver that has like this whole other- A uh, whole history. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 wait, do you find that working at Tiffany's, uh, you, it is the demand for silver pieces what it was? Is it less? Is it more? And also you can't kind of cheat it. You have to make it, all those pieces, you can't kind of like pretend that you can do it on a mass produced scale because you have to make it, right? Yeah, it is definitely, at least in my department. Um, yeah. Very handmade. Um, business, I mean, the majority of what we do is like commemorative pieces mm -hmm. um, for trophies for all the major league sports and everything. It's not um, the, the handmade silver that we do in my department is not really too available to right. The it's public. it's special pieces. Yeah. 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 The majority is commemorative. Pieces. And Ted, do you find that in your in your shop and and the pieces that you make is the silver, is it consistently in demand by your your people who collect your work? Yeah, but I'm I'm making somewhat functional whether it's a silver vase, um, a, a silver bell. Mm -hmm. um, a spoon, right. it has some use. 
um, to one degree or another. Um, yeah, and, and people buy it, be I think, because of the design. Mm -hmm. um, and we have it available in bronze and porcelain and you know, similar shapes and things, too. Um, but I just, I just know that full sets of you know, beautiful silverware are very, it's a hard sell these days. A hard sell, yeah. I don't yeah. made to make it, but that kind of silverware is also, um, it's, it's, it's compressed, be, it, yeah. it's, pound, it's pounded out. Um, it's not made like uh, James Robinson. Have you ever tried to do a piece, to, just taking the bar of silver and making like a spoon, a fork? A yeah, in, uh, uh, in New Paltz. Yeah. I stayed at New Paltz, and uh, that was something that, uh, just to learn how to right. forge and move the material right. around. Is there, is there a piece, it, like, do you have a sort of fantasy piece that, you're, that if you had all the time in the world, all the resources in the world, that you would make? Is there something you've seen historically or something that you think, oh, this would be the most beautiful thing if I could do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you did, did it. it. That's your piece. Yeah. He did it. I mean, sometimes I feel like my, all my work is a study for a silver piece, you know. But I'm very interested in the different um, communications that occur depending on your choice of material. So like a cast iron um, skillet is very different than a silver, silver candelabrum. Um, but you can take a cast iron skillet and polish it and have it chrome plated. And now it's like in conversation with silver mm. in a different mm. way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think silver is, you have to choose carefully when you're going to use it, given, given the, the challenges that we face financially and the audience. I mean, if you gave uh, somebody a silver piece for graduating, you know, a graduation present or whatever, right. compared to some of the other things that might pop to mind today for a graduation present. It's very interesting to think about what uh, what people are gonna um, when when is the right time for that right. uh, a gift of silver or whatever. How and what your audience is very important. You could teach uh, responsibility though too. Mm -hmm. you know, it could be here's your cup. You have to take care of it. You have to wash it. Mm -hmm. Learn, learn some responsibility. It might be a good time to eat the first piece of silver. When you or see a very a complicated a piece of silver, I think, I think we know, having seen your work, um, a lot of pieces of, of elaborate things are many different artisans have put their hands to it. Silver, if you see a very elaborate piece, one artisan has really been shepherding that piece to its conclusion, or sometimes different artisans work on it, How, or it, it depends? Um, I think it depends where you're getting it from. Like if you're getting it from a um, company, a big company, then there's probably a casting department. Mm -hmm. There's people doing all the artwork, the CAD work. Right. Then there's the silversmith. There might be another polisher. Somebody's making the, making the forms right. on a lathe. There can be a lot, but if you're getting it from kind of a mom and pop shop, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it might be one person doing it, or it might be kind of yeah. um, uh, like vendors, a bunch of vendors, uh, different people, and then one silversmith kind of assembling it mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's fascinating to look at the form language of the pieces that we studied in the, the meeting, where you could see how um, industrial production was used, create serial elements that could then be stacked and cut and pieced back together again. Mm -hmm. There's particular like kind of girdling of these bands that could be like rolled out with different textured designs or whatever. You just choose which belt you wanna put on top of which belt and then the spun bowl and boom, here comes a foot, ta-da. Um, and that, that, I think, didn't do much to sustain the public's interest in right. silver, right. <laughs> but it got a lot of it out when there was a bourgeoisie that had to, suddenly was able to afford, you know, to to operate in a certain um, exchange culture. That's it's, that's fascinating to me. We could talk for many hours mm. about the, mm. the anatomy of these objects that pop to mind uh, that we call silver. I have one last question because I know we're out of time. What what is the appeal of silver. What's your favorite part of working with silver? What is your passion for it? <laughs> oh, maybe that's not a good question. But it, I mean, as opposed to gold, because it must be a very different experience 
and you've all worked with gold. Oh. I'd like to raise a bowl out of gold, though, just to be able to compare. <laughs> I also, I, I like bronze as well. I mean, I love working in different metals for different reasons, but silver does lend itself to raising, and um, it's lovely to raise a, a cup. I mean, it's, yeah. it's noisy for the people around you, yeah. but it's very satisfying. <laughs> right. Um, and it just um, has a, a malleability that's um, unique to silver, and then it has a beautiful, warm glow, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. much more beautiful than nickel or platinum or... Yeah. Um, it's lunar. It's lunar. Yeah. Mm, that's so it's nice. the moon. Yeah. Yeah. I think I like that it's, uh, it's kind of slow. It's not like glass blowing. Let's say you have kind of one shot to do it in one day. Almost. Right. This we get to go really slow, think about it, and, uh, and keep working it. it <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay, well, I know our time is up, but thank you so much for having us all here, and thank you all. <laughs>